Okay, hello and, and welcome to um, our next edition of our um, Mingle Mastermind series. T uh, today we are um, talking about uh, partnerships and joint ventures and seeing if they're a right option for your business. And our expert today is Shereen Movahead from Rockamova Law, which is our resident legal advisor. Hi, Sharon. How are you doing today? Hi, Melissa. Hi, ladies. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here. And I'm really excited about today. Um, as Melissa mentioned, I am Shereen, the founder of Rockamova Law, and we basically help businesses get set up for success um, by doing all of the incorporation, the growth, the documents, you name it. Um, we want to see you succeed. And um, so I'm happy to be on this panel today and share all of that information. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, we've also got our two regular guests. We've got Dale Noel of True Model Management. How are you doing, Dale? Great. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for having me, Melissa. Um, what you're speaking about today, Shireen, is super important and also small business owners need a great lawyer on their side. So I'm glad you're here with us today. Uh, True Model Management, we represent all types of models, sizes, shapes, ethnicities, and we also have space to share with others in the community to do photo shoots, create content, and uh, we can also scan technology with other parts. So DM me or... Uh, Set a little chat and I'll connect with you soon. Wonderful. Um, hi, Catherine. How are you doing? Oh, are we a little? Uh, uh, we might be a little frozen. Poor, poor cat. She's got a, a wonderful, a new place to live, but it's not very helpful with the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Catherine. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I know. It's like wow. Um, it's Earth, Earth Week. We're doing the Swapateria, and I think this is a very important uh, topic. It's the 17th Sustainable Development Goal about partnerships and collaborations. So if the UN recognizes that it's important to collaborate and to partner with people of like-minded um, uh, ilk, I think it's good enough for us because it's a, it's a very important topic. I think that we're all where we are today because of partnerships. Absolutely. Look at Fashion Mingle. It's all about that. Absolutely. T tell us how Swapateria is going and t tell it, tell the audience what it is and then tell us how it's been going this week. Yeah, Swapateria is um, the brainchild of uh, Pat Patrick Duffy and Lablico. And what they have done is created a swap meet, the biggest swapping department store. So you bring clothes, that's your token of entry, and uh, you swap them out and they're constantly having new clothes coming in, beautiful items. They've asked for only high-end items. So I got some great deals. <laughs> Membership has its privileges, but it's a very interesting thing because when you get the, the item, you have to go into the swap chain and you have to get it. And so it has a traceability of who owns it. So the swap chain is a very unique concept about who owns the garments. So some of the garments, I'm the first owner. Some of them, I'm the third or fourth owner. So it's uh, very interesting and it makes for accountability and uh, traceability, which is very sustainable. It's so fascinating um, that you guys are doing this. I'm so excited to see where it goes. Hopefully it'll be something that we can expand to other cities. It's such a great concept. Well, okay, so let's get started. Um, so today we're gonna talk about how to create successful partnerships or joint ventures. Uh, you know, one of the, I have a lot of experience in this area from actually having partnerships and a couple of businesses that I've started. Um, before I started Fashion Mingle, I actually was, um, I had a, a, a web and graphic design business and I actually did have a partner for a while and um, that actually didn't go very well. <laughs> so I learned a lot about that. And then, um, and then when I started Fashion Mingle, um, I had a partner who had also started some entrepreneurial um, uh, businesses 
and uh, and she had actually had some partnerships that didn't work out. So it's all like learning a lot of lessons when you're doing partnerships. And of course, when you're um, doing something like where it's a legal partnership and people have the shares and the company and stuff like what we do with Fashion Mingle, it, it gets real serious then. And, you know, you have to really make sure that you're not making a mistake um, or and that, you know, you have enough, um, you know, understanding of, of the legal side to make sure that, you know, you don't regret <laughs> what you're doing down the line, which I'm sure happens all the time. So, uh, Shereen, we are so lucky to sure. have you here to um, guide us in what we need to think about when we're creating a partnership or a joint venture. So can you tell us what, what's the legal difference between a partnership and a joint venture? Oops, we don't have your audio. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, uh oh, we've got a problem. I, we just heard you a minute ago. And Kat, you can hear me and I can hear you, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So it's not on my end. Okay. Give us a moment while Shereen fills, uh, figures out the audio problem. Um, so I guess I could give you a little background on, um, she's going to drop out and come back in, um, on, um, how Fashion Mingle is structured. Um, you know, because when we set up Fashion Mingle, we had an investor and we had, um, and then Beth and I were co-founders. So we had to actually, um, you know, create partnership agreements. We had to issue uh, shares of stock to, you know, all three of us. And, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that our investor is a silent investor. <laughs> He's pretty like hands off, uh, but he gives great advice. And, um, but what often happens is your investor is also, also has a vote. So that's another thing that we, we can talk about uh, if you're going into a formal investment situation. But a lot of times uh, partnerships are just, are very loose and don't actually have any, um, any legal requirements. Are we back, Shereen? You hear me. I can hear you, yay. I don't know what happened. Um, always great. Um, <laughs> okay, so you're gonna <laughs> tell us about the difference between partnerships and joint ventures. Right, and that, and it's a great question, Melissa. The difference is, um, and there are, um, the biggest difference is between a joint venture and a partnership is that um, members of a joint venture have teamed up together for a particular purpose or a project. Whereas members of a partnership have joined together to run a business in common. So, you know, think of it as a collaboration um, versus, you know, forming a new business itself. Um, okay. So that's really the biggest, you know, um, essential difference between the joint venture. And, and a lot of times the joint ventures are businesses each individually, uh, you know, their own business. And they've sort of collaborated together to create, you know, to, to join efforts, to join, you know, resources for, um, you know, a particular business goal as opposed to a, an overall business. Um, so that's really the biggest difference. So each joint venture um, member um, retains ownership of their of, of of their own property, whether it's the intellectual property, the business property, whatever it may be. Um, so they just work on a collective effort towards a common uh, goal as opposed to a common business. Could you give us an example of what kind of situations a joint venture is more appropriate for? Yes, absolutely. So think of a joint venture. So you've got two, I mean, we can think of it, you know, there's many, um, it, um, you know, out there right now. Um, uh, Nike's partnership, right? Nike is its own entity. 
um, you know, collaborated with Rihanna and her, you know, and her business to, to come up with a shoe, right? So that particular shoe, it's a combination of both of their intellectual properties. And, um, you know, they would share in the profits of the production and sale of the shoe. Whereas, you know, Nike and Rihanna keep their own businesses and they have other businesses that they continue to do independently of each other. Um, okay. but, you know, so a, a true collaboration with, you know, two different um, entities that are combining their resources for, um, you know, like even uh, branding wise, you know, lipstick, right? You've got Mac and they collaborate with a celebrity um, and put the branding of that celebrity on the lipstick or on the perfume or whatever the, the case may be. So it's a particular product, I would say more a sense than, you know, anything else. Okay. So, uh, so the, so a joint venture agreement in this kind of case would include, would it, would it, it would, would it always include revenue share or does, does sometimes it also include expense share? Absolutely. Well, I mean, the heart of the matter is that a joint venture, you don't need to register a joint venture. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily need to register a joint partnership. They're both essentially creations of a contract between the parties. And that contract is quite fluid. It all depends on, you know, what, you know, who's bringing what, um, the value, the bargaining power, and of course, you know, whose resources are being used. So it doesn't have to be a straight 50-50 profit share. Um, it can be, you know, it all depends on, you know, who the different partners are and how much of each one's resources are being utilized. So yes, you could have it where they both split expenses or where you have one of them is, you know, taking on the majority of the expenses, maybe be utilizing their own um, you know, sources um, that they do for their other business anyways. And, and then the other party may just get a, a reduced um, uh, revenue share as opposed to just splitting everything down. So it really is a creature of contract, which means that it, it all depends on, you know, how the party set it up. And that's really, you know, we'll get into later, the, the, the heart of making a successful business relationship. It's all about the details in you know preparing that um arrangement okay and uh, cat i wouldn't be at all surprised if you've had a lot of experience doing the joint ventures yeah mine are all the joint ventures because i have other entities so when i come into a, an organization or whatever they pretty much hire me because i have um other resources so joint venture is the way to go because partner gets a little bit um sticky because it's like you know sweat equity and all this stuff you know if you don't have money that you're bringing to the table you know it's it's a tough thing to split so i think um joint joint venture is the way to go especially with um you know producing and all that so you know i bring a lot of uh resources to the table and it's a good it's a good fit in that respect so um and it's so, kind of a nice way to try out a, a relationship uh because it's temporary and you can see how well you work together and, right. and that way you've got some trust going forward if you wanted to do anything more formal yeah, exactly. And I think also, uh, you know, I, I have like our past seminars, <laughs> I am doing uh, trademarking for all of my resources that I'm bringing to the table. So there's no claim to ownership on any of those. So it's my resources that I'm trademarking and bringing to the table. So okay. that's a very important. I paid attention to these masterminds. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good thing that you brought up, Catherine, because I think that's really one of the, the what like when we get into the heart of the, of the, you know, how to really actually create the, the, the relationship, that's really one of them, making sure that you have, you know, open dialogue and clearly detailing who's doing what and who's keeping what, uh, because the heart of all agreements and failures in, in a joint venture or business, it's all about, we didn't think about these things until afterwards. And now, now it's, 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 it's harder to resolve a dispute when there's no mechanisms in place to guide you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. Get that all taken care of. <laughs> yeah. Dale, I know with your business, you've, you've had true model management for a really long time and it's probably had a lot of different uh, iterations. Have you had experience with partnerships or joint ventures? Uh, I've had uh, many experiences with the collaborations as joint ventures and I agree with everything that you said 100%. It's such an amazing way to figure out who you work well with, how you work, really put your mind to thinking like what could go wrong, play devil's advocate Mm -hmm. and put down every single scenario and make sure, you know, all the percentages and the dollars, like it's written down. Not like, oh, well, I thought I was gonna get half. Like, oh, 50% of what, you know? It's like everything needs to be there. And of course, along the way you realize, you know, who you can trust and who Mm -hmm. you, you know, can do even bigger deals with in the future they've led to other projects as well as far as the partnership i came close to i did all the work to be a partner with someone for another business but then in the end as we were writing all the terms you know we agreed to everything verbally and you know wrote our notes and everything but once you know and i was the one footing the bill for the lawyers and like everything because the other person was going to have more of the sweat equity so in the end, um, still think this person's great, but in the end, we realized, you know, the terms seemed to change. When it really came down to writing, it's like, oh, well, you know what? I want to be able to take everybody with me, or oh, I want to be able to, you know, make it the name. I want to make it later. You know, it was just like, whoa, 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 you know, like that's yeah. not what we agreed to. So sometimes you get pretty deep into it and you realize like this is getting a little too complicated, and they're yeah. like too many miscommunications. So we're better off doing the joint venture. So now the person that I almost became partners with, you know, fabulous business person, but uh, better as joint uh, mm-hmm. with a joint venture. Yeah. And I like how you brought, uh, brought up, you know, you it's hard to think through all the things that you need to think through and, and what could go wrong. I, I had, because I had done, you know, I guess originally I had done more joint ventures when I had my web design business with, um, with another graphic designer. And, um, and so we, so it was loose. We didn't have anything on paper. Um, but then like when I, um, ended up like after a couple of years, I was doing something a little bit different and I had someone who wanted to partner with me. And so I had kind of learned from that original experience. So it was actually like kind of writing up a draft contract. And I really focused on, what would happen in the exit, you know, like, like what, you know, what happens if we decide to break this partnership? And she was so like offended. Um, and I was like, no, this is smart. We have to think about this. She was really, really offended. And, um, and so we didn't do it (laughs) because I was thinking about what could go wrong. Yeah. Exit strategies, planning that is huge. And I'm sure Shireen can tell you from a legal perspective exactly what that entails. Go hunky story until it falls apart. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, everybody's got competing interests. I mean, of course you need to go into any business venture with what's best for you and your business and everybody you're partnering with, it has the same mindset. So it's not like you have to be angry or, you know, think someone's trying to screw you or something. It's really about, you know, everybody has to get out of it. What's best for them. I mean, uh, Shireen, uh, do you have some cautionary tales you can share? I think there's not enough time to share as many calls <laughs> that I've gone through. But you're right. One of the things that, I mean, I'll basically break it down for you. Um, there are, when you're looking at, um, you know, getting into business as these ladies have experienced, it, it, you've got to, you've got to spell everything out and learn what you're, you know, one of the conversation pieces you need to have is the exit plan, because it's not about the end. It's about, where, where is this goal going to where, what, what is the end goal? And in most businesses, it's either to sell it, right. And, you know, get an acquisition or, or, you know, a, a legacy point, um, either case, you have to talk about the end when you're at the beginning. Otherwise mm-hmm. there's no clear, um, you know, goals to be, to be going, guiding you through this. Um, so anyone 
that has experience with someone being concerned about an exit strategy, which is a absolute necessity in discussing business terms, is not someone you want to do business with. It's, it's someone that just is not ready for that level of you know, commitment and seriousness. Um, this is not, this is not a game. I mean, it, you know, you're going to be putting your time, energy, and money into this. So um, a lot of things you need to think about. Um, and, and unfortunately there's, you know, I'll give you one very recent example. Uh, two great partners went into business together, created an incredibly successful brand. I'm not going to name it right now. Um, and this brand carries a lot of goodwill. Unfortunately, the partners had a difference of opinions, had a difference of personalities, and that has come to light in the last few years, creating basically, essentially, they're at a point of disillusion. Um, and one partner wants to take it over, the other partner sort of wants nothing to do with it, but doesn't know how to let go. Um, and of course, they never spoke about these things. It's not written in any agreement. And... Um, and the sad thing is, is that if they break up this company, they're going to lose the incredible goodwill that is attached to this company. Yeah. Um, it's incredibly valuable. And they could essentially sell this and get be very well off. Um, but they're in the, in the heart of a dispute between the two. And they're essentially going to rip up all those years of effort that they've put into this company and this brand which is very successful. And that's what can happen if you don't pre-plan for worst case scenarios and not even just worst case scenarios. Like, you know, if there was a death or incapacity of one of the partners, how does the other one move forward? You know, who's, in, who's allowed to come in and take over their position? But also in the case of, I no longer am interested in doing this. How do I get myself out of this? Um, and if it's not spoken, a lot of times under state law, if it's not written that the company can continue on, especially in a case of like a member LLC, for example, if it's not in the, if it's not written um, that the other members can continue on, if one of them withdraws, then you under under state. Uh, state law, you have to actually dissolve the company. You can't wow. even go on. You can't move on. Um, and that has happened to another, wow. um, unfortunately, uh, client that I had to deal with. So it was the end of something that really did not need to end if it was clearly spelled out in an agreement. So it, it really is all about knowing who your partner is. Um, you know, I would say these are the things that you want to think about before going into business with anyone, whether it's a partnership or a joint venture, which I completely agree is a great way of getting your feet wet um, and learning more about the other party is, you know, know who your party, who your partner is, um, you know, and, and if it's, if it's new, you know, gather information from others that are around you um, that may know them uh, just to see their business style, you know, because um, personality conflicts can be a real problem when you're mm -hmm. dealing with partnerships. It's very intimate. It's not, you know, a major corporation, you're going to be dealing with each other on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even cultural differences, right? You know, there's different cultures that have different ways of doing things. And it's instilled in our, you know, you know, culture, I know, you know, um, the Asian culture has, you know, generally speaking, uh, a, a different way of doing, uh, doing things. If you've ever been to Japan, you can see that <laughs> they're just mm -hmm. incredibly different, um, you know, different organizations and such uh, things like that. So a cu someone's culture can also affect how they do business with you. Um, and then of course, looking at each one's roles, who's going to be doing what and what exactly is that going to, how is that going to contribute uh, to the level of that they're gonna get back? Um, it needs to obviously make sense. Um, and as we discussed, you know, all the contingencies before the agreement is signed, discuss on everything that needs to be done. Because another thing that I get a lot of times is, okay, well, we put everything in this agreement, but there's something else that we, um, you know, want to want to agree to, but we don't want to put it in the agreement. We'll just agree to it on the side. Well, guess what? Most agreements have a clause that basically says that if it's not written in this agreement, it's not, it's not valid, right? This is the, the most recent, um, you know, agreement between the parties and nothing else matters. So even if you were to keep something on the side or have a verbal agreement to something else, this, when you sign an actual agreement, 
then you're saying that this is the only thing that is applicable. So nothing else could be legally valid. Um, so I just want to caution people who want to have side agreements, you know, depending on how that side agreement is structured, um, it could very well be void and, and, and useless, essentially. Um, and why do, when do you do a memo of understanding and an operating agreement? That's when do you do that? Yeah, great question. So a memorandum of uh, understanding is basically, as, as um, Dale mentioned earlier, getting together with the party without, it's not a formal legal binding agreement. It's just, you're just breaking down the terms that you're willing to agree to. So you can take all of the points that you talked about, the compensation, who's doing what, you know, what happens in case of, you know, this and that, all those big points that the parties discussed would go into a memorandum of understanding. Yes, you would both sign it, but you're not really signing an official agreement to do it. You're signing an agreement that you're going to do it. Um, so it's very different legally speaking. You can't be necessarily held responsible for signing an, a, a memorandum of understanding, which is an MOU or you know uh, an LOI, letter of intent, very similar um, in that respect. It's an intention that you're agreeing to these points um, sort of, you know, to, to follow up on Dale's example with, with the partner that she was going to. They agreed on some points, but then when that got transferred over into a formal agreement and an operating agreement, which is the agreement that a parties would, a members of an LLC would sign, for example, that's when all of the legal uh, provisions are also added into place. And in that time, that's official, that's formal, and you can rely on it. And so that has a different legal validity to it than an MOU, which is basically a promise that we basically are going to get into an agreement. Letter of intent. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Shireen, um, you know, the, like with the cautionary tales you told us, I mean, things can go really wrong. Do you have some uh, advice for how to avoid disputes or, um, you know, what are some of the things that we should do? Like if there is a dispute to make sure it doesn't go too far and hurt the company. Yeah. Well, I mean, as we mentioned, it's good to talk about what's going to happen in case of dispute and put that into the agreement. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, solving resolution ahead of time will definitely help um, in factoring in how that how that conflict does get resolved. I mean, everyone's gonna have conflict, whether you're in a personal relationship or a business relationship, um, different personalities, different you know, ways of, of doing things. It, there's, gonna, there's gonna be differences of opinion. So for example, uh, in, in your agreement, in your partnership or joint venture agreement, you can decide on um, you know, how you would have a tiebreaker um, between you know, decisions that are made between the partners. So if there's two of you, um, you can say, uh, this third party, and you can either identify a third party if you know one that you trust, sort of like an, as, an, as, as an advisory role to your business, um, or just say, you know, a third party mediator or arbitrator or, or someone like that would come in to help you resolve any disputes that you may have with with your partner um, or have a tiebreaker vote, someone that would have a super majority uh, vote between, you know, over the two of you, if you're in a deadlock situation between what would happen um, in, in, in a, you know, on, on a particular decision. So the best way to avoid, you know, getting into the situation is pre-preparing yourself for how that situation gets resolved. But even if you haven't, at least, and, you know, as I mentioned recently in this case with this new, you know, with this issue, with this brand and the, you know, um, the, the two partners that are in, in, in arguments with each other, um, basically you can agree to have a mediator come in, even, even though you don't have it in an agreement, to try to resolve it in an informal way. I mean, you can't be, ma you can't be mandated to take their opinion or, or whatnot, but at least having someone come in, and in this case, I'm essentially stepping in as an advisor, um, to be, and, and it's a neutral third party. I have no interest or benefit to this conflict. Conflict. I'm simply there to give the best opinion on one, what would happen in the, if, if, if this was to obviously dissolve and, and, and try to see if there's a way for the parties to settle their disputes. Obviously, you know, settlement is the best way to 
to resolve a dispute. And, and um, having done litigation for many, many years, I can say the only people that win in a litigation are the lawyers. So <laughs> it is really, it's, an, it's a no-win situation because even if you've won, you're out of pocket, you're out of time, you know, you're, the mental anguish that goes into a lawsuit, especially when you're dealing with partners, it's always personal. Um, so it's, it's not worth it. It's, it's always better to try to either, you know, put it in your agreement that you're willing to do some sort of resolutionary, um, you know, mediation or something, or, um, or at least, you know, agree to it when you're in the midst of the conflict, give it to someone that you could, you both trust or, or, you know, a neutral third party that, that can handle it because otherwise you're, you're going to be at a deadlock. There really is no other way to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our uh, attendees has a question. I'm gonna, going to allow her to, I'm going to push the button and allow her to talk. The chat wasn't working for a moment, so sorry about that, uh, but I think I have it fixed. So, uh, oh, what is your question for Shireen? Well, you know, um, there's, um, once the lawyer gets in sometimes, you know, the, 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 the devil is in the detail and then, you know, it's almost like, you know, showing is very good advice. I wish that, you know, when my younger days, I get into dating, we can agree up front what you go and what's my goal. <laughs> it's almost like dating. Right? <laughs> I'm looking to get married. No, I, you know, I'm just looking to play, you know, so <laughs> if that discussion up front, right. But um, I want to share that recently that, you know, um, I'm a startup, right. And, and I'm sure that most of uh, everyone here is a, is a brand that's just starting out and now you get into we recently i took the advice of you know all you guys last time you know uh thank you for picking on me and um we got feature in vogue so uh we got picked up and they wrote a little piece about us and so now we actually were approached by several big brands Right. And so now it's a kind of power yeah. situation. Yeah. I'm just a startup, right? <laughs> what should, you know, and then big brands are like, you know, want to run you to the, you know, want everything for free. So it's kind of like, you know, how do I manage that partnership where, you know, maybe, you know, it would end up badly, but maybe, you know, I, I want it to be hurt so good, you know, just like a relationship. <laughs> Right. So how do you uh, navigate that? Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, congratulations in being in Vogue. You absolutely deserve it. And we look forward to seeing your 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 brand blossom. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, that's a very good question. It's um, as I mentioned earlier, when you have two different companies that are going into business together, you want to, you know, a joint venture in a joint venture relationship, you retain all ownership rights to your um, property, you know, your intellectual property, your physical property, all of those things. So um, when you're collaborating with another brand to use their their, their intellectual property to basically create, you know, a particular type of product, you want to make sure that that is very clear on who owns what, and there needs to be an exhibit list attached to that agreement that clearly states what the parties have, what is involved in the, in the joint venture, you know, what you're going to collaborate on and what you're going to utilize as part of your business's resources and their business's resources, and what maintains and, 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 you know, stays your property. And, and also, you know, the, 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 the other issue is who retains ownership of the new property that's created between the two of you, um, you know, that new intellectual property. And most times it would be a joint, uh, joint ownership. So you would both have ownership of it. So if you were to register it, um, you know, you would both be co-owners of that, collaborated property, but I would make sure that you don't lose sight of your own property and that nothing, you know, especially when it comes to software and I deal with a lot of software agreements, um, making sure that you retain all of that, even if you inputted some of the pieces of your, um, you know, protected software into, into the product, into the new product, 
um, that you still retain that and that they can't change it. You know, we can definitely get into more details on that because I would love to speak to you about making sure you're, you're very adequately protected in that sort of agreement, because that is really where companies get lost. And those that don't know what they're doing get sucked in to the, the powers of the bigger brand. And you, know, and you absolutely have a right to negotiate your agreement. You don't need to just take their agreement just because they're a big brand and they had these you know, fancy, fancy lawyers creating this template for them. It was made for them to protect them, not necessarily to protect you. So you need to make sure that you have someone on your side to, to, to confirm that there's measures in place to protect your interests as well. Wow, thank you. That's um, very good advice. You know, I mean, we have Sharin, so I have, we have big fancy lawyer too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. But the good thing about me is that you're not paying for my overhead. And that's why I left the big fancy practice, um, because it's just unfair. You know, most of the time, um, you know, these lawyers, they generally charge to, you know, for their office desk and their high rises and all of that. So um, it's it's really unnecessary, unfortunately. And it's it's out of reach for, for most entrepreneurs. But that's why I want you to know that, yes, you don't need to have a lawyer in a big high rise in a big company and charging, you know, $1,000 plus an hour uh, to get a good contract. You just need to make sure that you trust that lawyer that's going to be providing mm -hmm. advice and, and, and keeping on your best interests. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that, um, Shirin, you're in the right you know, um, position because fashion and digital worlds are merging. And these talk that they've been contacting me is all about digital fashion and NFT. Right. It, it gets very confusing, actually, if, if you know, and the lawyer that I, you know, the attorney that I deal with in Silicon Valley don't understand fashion and, you know, and they only understand digital. So all of that is very confusing about who owns what <laughs> and how we can. Yeah. So uh, it's a new frontier here. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. It really does help to have someone who understands the industry because it really is industry specific. And um, every every industry has their nuances, has their general practices. Um, so if you don't use someone that understands and recognizes the risks and you know the rights that you have in a particular industry and the, and the importance of you know that particular product or service that you're offering um, and its relevancy in your industry, you're going to miss a lot of key, key points that may not um, adequately protect you. And that's, that's what can happen because, you know, just speaking about digital products themselves, they don't touch upon a lot of the, the nuances that the fashion industry has. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Oh, that was, that was um, good to hear those questions from you. Um, so uh, Shireen, I know that, um, you know, one, you know, in partnerships, this is something I've always heard is that, you know, if you're doing a partnership with someone, uh, you know, of course, at the beginning, everybody's got the best intentions. Um, but in the end, there's always one person who's stronger than the other there, uh, or might put in more work than the other. Um, is there, um, a way to just kind of like put in the original agreement, like, should you put like how much people should contribute as far as the sweat equity? Um, is there a way to kind of, you know, somehow keep that balance equal? Um, Cause I think that's what I've heard. That's, you know, is one of the most difficult things about a partnership. Absolutely, Melissa, you can, you can, in a contract, it's all, it's all up to the parties and how they want to, um, you know, create the, the, the share, you know, the equity share and the, um, the responsibility share. So, you know, as I mentioned before, and Catherine can speak to this as well, it's, it's all about what you're bringing to the table and there needs to be value given to that. And that's something that you need to weigh in. And if you are feeling undervalued and bullied essentially by, your, by the other party, then one, that's a red flag, right? They don't truly appreciate you know, what you're bringing to the table and they're, you, and they're essentially wanting to take advantage of 
whatever it is that you have. So one, recognize the value that you're bringing because in most cases, yes, there is going to be a lot of sweat equity. It's not, not necessarily the sweat part. It's, it's the, you know, you're bringing in your knowledge and experience. Like Kat has so much knowledge and experience in mm -hmm. the industry and the things that she does um, very well. So she's bringing in her mind into a lot of this. The creativity is all in her mind. That is her greatest asset. And um, that's what they're, that's what they're going to value when figuring out what she's going to bring to the table and what she's going to get as a result of, of, Mm -hmm. of her efforts. So you absolutely want to make sure that there is a value given and you are comfortable with that value. And um, if, and then, and of course, spell it out in the roles and responsibilities of each party, right? So um, in, in particular with a joint venture, you really are laying down exactly who's bringing what and what they're going to get out of it. And I mean, anyone can see whether or not there's balance to that. If someone is bringing in a lot and getting very little and the other one is just sort of, you know, maintaining everything, but not really doing much. Well, I mean, it would be incredibly unfair for them to get more, you know, more interest in, in the project than you are. So, I mean, you could, you could see that there's inequalities in, in the breakdown. And as I said, if you're not able to resolve them before you enter into a relationship with someone, then you definitely know this is not a relationship, as Dale mentioned. You know that, you know, there's certain things that you just can't um, accomplish with this other person, you know, and so it's best to either walk away or create a different type of relationship where the commitment level is not as deep as, as a partnership. Mm -hmm. So with, uh, so it's, it is common, I think in a lot of partnerships that like one person has the money, one person has the time. Um, and I think that, you know, I've, I've kind of seen some situations where the person that has the money feels like they should have the power, whereas um, the person with the idea or the creative talent, I've, I've actually seen this in a situation funding um, uh, a designer collection um, that, you know, the actual designer um, wasn't equal was it considered equal whereas it was that person's creativity that even makes the business possible so how do you deal with that because I mean it is like obviously if you have a business idea you can't grow it without money <laughs> you know so but but then you also can't grow it without the creativity so how do you balance those two things and should one person in the partnership have more of a, a percentage of ownership or is 50-50 normal? Yes, another great question. I see this too much as well, um, especially in the fashion industry. It happens more often than not, where one is the creative aspect, the designer, and the other is the funder. Um, and without the funder, there's there's no money to buy the material and create the you know the create the the product. So of course there needs to be always someone with funding available. Um, but no, it doesn't necessarily need to be that person doesn't necessarily need to have the power either. Either. It can either be, you know, equal depending on how much, you know, how much um, effort is really being put in by the designer and, and of course the reasonableness of the investor essentially um, in the project. But I always um, tell the designers this, if you can't get at least an equal vote to what is happening in your business, because it's essentially late, rel relying on your um, creative output uh, you are the only worker. You are the product. You are creating the brand. Uh, the other is just, a, you know, basically just funding it. So if you can't get at least an equal, if not a majority interest in your business, then it, it, it's most likely not the best, um, you know, time for you to, to get into business with someone that's not going to give you that power. Because as the creative, as the one who's creating the, the, the goodwill, the actual brand itself, uh, you have to have control in how your business 
is developed. You may not have the business sense, which of course we see that a lot in the fashion community. Um, and I'm, you know, working to try to help. Um, and I know Dale does it too, you know, uh, teaching at the institutions to make sure that, you know, these up and coming designers have some business knowledge, have some awareness of how to do business because it's absolutely, I mean, they're coming out to do business, right? So they need to know and be aware of how to negotiate business deals for themselves. Um, but, but if you cannot have control in your company, then you're, you, there's more times than not, you're going to have problems and those problems will lead to essentially the end of that business. So other, rather than wasting time, um, you know, come to an agreement beforehand that's going to give you at least um, power, you know, controlling power to make the ultimate decision that affects your brand and, mm -hmm. you know, everything that mm -hmm. you put into it. Yeah. One, one thing I've definitely seen is uh, people are so, they, they love their idea so much or, or the, the small business that they've started is that, you know, they're just desperate for help. And so they make a, yeah, you know, they make a impulsive decision to get into a partnership thinking everything's going to be rosy. Um, like, can you give people some tips on like what that due diligence should be? Uh, I mean, obviously the, you know, getting, getting your own lawyer is probably super important, but that is a big expense. And a lot of people just don't want to put that out if they're looking for, um, you know, in investment funding. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the key is to find, you know, in most of these cases, um, these businesses, you know, obviously don't have very much outside funding. So, so that initial funding would have to come from an angel investor. And that's essentially someone who comes in at the early stages of your business. Otherwise, if your business is, you know, obviously generating sufficient revenue and, and is, you know, has other investors, then it's different type of, you know, usually you'd get more VC funding, venture capital funding in later stages of a business. But for, mo for the most part in the fashion industry, in the beauty industry, you're looking for angel investments. And those are, uh, those are going to come from investors who under who will basically either love you know love you love the entrepreneur behind the business because you have to believe in the entrepreneur they are the you know they're the reasons why the brand is created so there needs to be sort of you know a, a liking uh, to you and and to your potential um, as well as um, you know the potential of the brand itself there's not going to be a lot of numbers behind it. There may not be a lot of revenue behind it. It may just be an idea, may be a great idea. So there has to be someone who's willing to have faith in the process, have faith in you essentially as the entrepreneur. So you, it, it really is, um, and finding the right angel investor is hard. And it's hard because most investors that are, you know, general investors, don't invest in fashion companies. It's a very difficult industry to understand and appreciate because it doesn't always make sense on paper. And it's really, I know Melissa can speak to this. It is very oh, yeah. different. <laughs> I've had a lot of experience with yeah, that. And investors that aren't used to investing in the fashion and beauty industry won't understand your numbers, won't understand that you know, it doesn't necessarily make dollars and cents. It doesn't have the ROI return on investment that they're looking for. And those are the numbers that they'll see on your balance sheets and, and the financial projections that you're gonna have. There's a lot of faith that has to go involved in it because the most important part of these fashion brands is the brand name itself, the, that, 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 you know, that intellectual property is, is, is incredibly important. And that doesn't necessarily have an actual business value. It has to be, you know, sort of created and it's created based on, you know, obviously how the consumers interact with it. Um, so there's a lot of like numbers that are not obvious on paper um, to a normal investor. So if you are looking for funding, you're going to have to look for funding from 
from investors, from angel investors that are familiar with your industry and mm -hmm. know how to value you and your business. Because otherwise, you honestly are wasting your time and wasting their time. And in the end, you know, you're going to be disappointed by, by, mm -hmm. by not getting the right investment. But there are, and I work with them and I continue to meet more angel investors and, you know, happy to, to, you know, spread the network and get, and get mm -hmm. funding for businesses that truly do need and deserve this funding, um, by, by investors who know how to value your mm -hmm. brand. Yeah. I think you really have to really educate yourself on what investors are looking for, and you have to have a business that can scale globally because that's, that's all they're interested in. You know, they're just interested in, in making money with a good business idea. Um, some of the resources, I, you know, big problem in creative industries is not having the business degree, not, you know, really understanding how to run a business. Um, and I've actually found a lot of help through an organization called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, uh, and it's mostly made up of retired business executives who volunteer their time to uh, talk to entrepreneurs. And, um, uh, you know, depending on where you live, your I think your your local SCORE can be a hit or a miss, um, but because everything's virtual now, um, you know, my, go, my secret is to just go with the NYC score because <laughs> I don't think it matters where you live uh, because I've, I've certainly tried score in other places that I've lived and I don't get the uh, same quality of mentor um, because they're used to more traditional businesses when you're in like a mid-level city, whereas New York City, you know, everything happens there. So you're, you know, you're going to have a, a, a much more advanced uh, mentor, I think. Uh, but the thing that really helped me um, that I really took a lot from was just how to prioritize decisions Um and you know just like understanding the that it's you know you can't um you can't you have to be loyal to your business in order for it to be successful and sometimes because we're women we are we we tend to be loyal to employees or you know uh and maybe you don't make the right decisions because you're being, you're not being as loyal to the, to the business. And I know that's a hard thing for people to like hear, um, but in the end, the business has to survive. And so sometimes you have to make hard decisions that might break your heart, but, um, but the business has to survive. You know, that's what I got out of, out of my in information, my mentoring anyway. <laughs> and it's about being a boss, Melissa, right? Whether you're a male, whether we want to or not. <laughs> about being a boss and just knowing yeah. that you have the best interests of your business in mind. And anyone who supports your business and wants to grow in your business would appreciate that perspective. Right. right. So, so if they don't, and if they're really just out there for themselves, and what am I getting out of it? What am I getting out of it? And then you obviously, you know, have to make a decision that is that maybe that person is not, um, you know, going to help uh, grow your business because they're not interested in your your business itself. They're interested in their own um you know, and, and that's fair because everybody's looking at it from their perspective. So it's like you don't want to be, uh, you know, like they, well, they're not thinking about me and my business. Well, you know what? Because it's them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're thinking about themselves, which is what we all have to do, <laughs> you know. And then, so honesty. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, like a, a situation. If, if something's going wrong, you really, I think, have to have to really put yourself in that person's shoes and give them the freedom to um, to figure out what's right for them. Yeah, you know. Melissa, I just had a comment on, I think it was great that you brought up SCORE, and uh, I had worked with a couple of mentors from SCORE many years ago, 
um, even before True. And the experience, the stories you hear from them, they help you like, you know, try to think of things that might happen that you might have not have thought of. But I, one thing I will say that do not rely on them for legal advice. Or <laughs> no, I change because <laughs> I did, you know, just be like, oh, what do I do about this? So that's where Shireen, you make sure if they're going to yeah. any, you know, different mentorship programs and they're not lawyers that are current in yeah. the state and also in the state, because you want to make sure that if they're talking about a business and it's all these different nuances that it's like, was it New York or was it, you know, mm -hmm. so it's really like related. Cause if you get too, I found if you go too specific with them and I'm very like a million questions, curious, want to like dot every dot. Sorry. So I was asking him every question and then I realized after, Ooh, maybe some I should not <laughs> ask them. So. Yeah. And I think you do, you have to find the right mentor. You know, right. the one that they just randomly assigned to you may not be the right, the right one. Not all um, created equal. That's absolutely true. And you know yeah. what you were saying about employees and I, I have, I'm at fault, I guess, for that with like caring for people. And it's like, all right, it might not be the best business decision, but it's like, I tried to always try and find the balance of that. And it is very difficult to make decisions sometimes. And, and yeah. like, it, it, it is. It is. I think because we're women, we're a little, we're, we're just not as cutthroat, um, I think, as men naturally are. Uh, and I've certainly, I know when I had my web design business, I had um, a friend who was a guy who had a hosting business. And I really admired uh, just how tough he could be. Um, and I learned a lot from him, uh, because it, you know, it was, I mean, he had, he had to provide for his family. Uh, so he had to be tough about the decisions he made. Whereas I had my husband, you know, and so I didn't have to be as, as tough. And so that's something we always have to think about, I, I think for sure. Um, we've got two questions before we close out. Uh, I'm going to bring um, O back in because she wants to talk about fundraising. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I was just um, wanted to make sure that, you know, um, I'm actually building a, a fundraising database for women, but um, because I got fed up with and I have like, a, uh, you know, you can contact me later if you want all the list of investors in particular uh, format, but I got fed up with you know, I'm here seeing the numbers that fundraising for women, uh, women, female founder, it, you know, even though we get all the press coverage, it's, you know, become lower, lower. <laughs> it's not going to, it's going the wrong way. Right. And, and what we as women don't do is that we kept pitching to pardon me, pardon my French, nothing against me, all the asshole there. <laughs> <laughs> and we keep because they have money we keep offering them opportunity to invest in female founded company which has better return of investment right so there's no reason for them to change ever because you know they get you know cream of the crop keep offering them and they keep treating women very badly <laughs> so you know I, i'm building this database where you can comment it's like, kind of like glass door and it's going to be free to everyone's it's open source where you can basically put your, um, you know, comment and input and rate them on, you know, mm -hmm. on, on what it is. So um, stay That's tuned. so uh, nice of you. Oh, I'm- Well, it's open source. I did this with all the female interns from okay. various wow. top school. <laughs> they also have the cause, right? They want to see us, you know, right. succeed, right? Uh, but I want to mention that many of my female founder friends have made this mistake where the first thing they did was to see someone who's interested but for investment, you need to first check their background, check mm -hmm. who did they invest it in, right? right? If they invest, because they won't sign an NDA with you. So whatever you share, they forward directly to whoever. So if they're in the business and they invest in your sort of competitor, kind of, they would get a direct deck <laughs> yeah. from what you have to, to your competitor. So this is would be like the first mistake is, mm -hmm. you know, I would go on Crunchbase and I would check mm -hmm. out, you know, who did they invest it in and, right. you know, right. And, and see whether any of those is their competitor. Absolutely. Um, Crunchbase right? is such a great resource if you're looking for investors, because then you, you see the companies that they've invested in and then you can, you can check out those companies to see like, are they still operating? You know, mm -hmm. what, you know, uh, 
you know, is that, did this turn out to be a successful investment? And mm -hmm. so if you're in this, in a similar industry, that investor is going to be much more likely to, um, to be interested in you. I mean, I've kind of always felt that my trifecta is an investor that, you know, um, uh, wants to, you know, invest in tech, a technology platform, um, a, um, a community platform, someone who's invested in, in community platforms in the past and also has something in the fashion or beauty industry in their portfolio. So I know that they understand my industry because otherwise you're just wasting your time. I've gone to a lot of conferences for, for women where they bring in investors and it was so hilarious when I would go up and you have this opportunity to pitch to the investor. And the first thing they say is, I don't know anything about fashion. And right, right, right. I mean, they just cut you off in a hot second. And so I just had to, like, I knew they were going to say that almost every single one of them say that. And so I just say, well, it's not about fashion. And then that shocks them. And I said, it's about entrepreneurs and connecting them globally and helping them build their business. You know, so it doesn't necessarily matter that it's fashion. It's really about people making money and getting jobs, you know, right, so right. that um, that helped because that stopped them and made them listen to me. Um, certainly when you're in a, you know, like a conference situation or a. Uh, 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 you know, look for opportunities to, um, you know, pitch to an investor one-on-one -on -one that where they're mentoring opportunities, because that way you can hone your skills and you can hone your pitch. Um, I went to South by Southwest and participated in, uh, I got to like pitch, you know, one-on-one -on -one to all these investors that were just there to mentor you. And, um, they, they would apologize, you know, like, well, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I'm like, no, I want you to hurt my feelings. I want you to tell me the bloody truth, you know, and just like punch me. I, I can take it, you know, um, because that's what those opportunities are for. Um, and then another uh, thing I've you know, really advise is, is that you actually look for advisors in your industry, people that have built businesses uh, or have been at higher levels of your industry so that they can give you business advice and, and you can, um, you know, right. call on them when you've got just so, different decisions or you need some direction. So my, I have been successful and this is my million dollar advice here. Um, if you want intro to investors, you know, go to Crunchbase, look at their, what they, and even though you don't know how to approach them, look at who they invested in and you would approach the, the business or the, the founder of that company that they invested in because founder themselves, um, mm -hmm. founder themselves, you know, feel your pain, especially yeah. female founder. And they would introduce you to people because they want to help, right? Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes you have to kind of, and that's what I do a lot, uh, sell your sob story, you know, put, put a good one together. Strategy. Right. But, you know, put, yeah, put a, uh, put a, that, that, that's what I would say is that, um, that, that some of these uh, pitching events, uh, I have to be honest, uh, it's kind of like they, they make money off entrepreneur and I feel really they sad. They absolutely do. Right? right? They, they charge you to go in and then really you have no business going in. You're just spending money for no reason. Absolutely. But, you know, you know so it's um, one of these things where uh, be, be careful. Just, you know, yeah. do your homework. And, and you, you, homework, LinkedIn and Crunchbase is your friend. So, yeah. you know, um, right. And so did, did, does, um, so that, that's, that's the only thing yeah. I would say. I, I agree with you hundred percent. There is a huge um, uh, industry before COVID where everybody was putting on these investor events and, you know, you pay a thousand dollars and you're going to get to be in front of all these investors and, or they want you to, um, uh, uh, they, they invite you to um, submit a pitch. So, and then like, they'll have a competition, they'll review all your, your pitches that you submit and then choose who gets to present. And so I tried this a couple of times and what I realized all they were doing was trying to get my email address and so that they could sell me a conference, <laughs> you know, it wasn't at all about, they already knew who they were allowing to pitch. It wasn't, a real competition, you know, and I just 
happened to figure that out just because I actually knew some of the um, people managing the event and kind of like, oh, I, I see what they're doing. And this is, um, this is just like a money making deal, you know, well, I think that you know, I mean, I am a proponent of uh, changing the way investment worked, but I don't, I don't know what it is yet. I'm just smart enough to know there's something wrong with it. But, you yeah. know, women, you know, invest with hearts and we shouldn't lose that. We should not lose that mm -hmm. because, you know, because men invest with just their pocket money, right? right. <laughs> they want, it's all about, right? But right. without us, right, the world wouldn't be, you know, caring, you know, you know, all of that, right? So right. we should find a way for ourselves to invest with heart and also make money. So that's yeah. a different mm -hmm. business model, and right? And, and I post that to all the, this question to all the anthropologists and economists that are women. You think about what is the inherent bias in the current investment models. They are biases <laughs> yeah. and the way that they evaluate situation. And, and I, I didn't like the way that um, they evaluate business because they, they did it like a report card where they check mark everything. It's like all passing. You have to all the investment metric. You have to have a C or a B, right? But what I, I would prefer the, the grading like the way college or high school does. Why can't I get an A plus on something and <laughs> a C on the other and we average it out. I'm still get a 3.5. What, what's happening to that <laughs> right i mean you know i mean this, this is i just want to pose that we are the times are changing the more women are in the investment community mm -hmm. and the model will change but yes. don't lose the hearts right because i yeah. i actually went and in, in uh, and i show you know all my businesses all the stuff that i did the vc looked at me this is by a famous vc they looked at me and he you know what he get he said small medium-sized businesses table they're gonna go out of business nobody wants to help them and I am like you're I'm like I'm heartbroken that is hard yeah. that's yeah. very hard right and this is how VC sees it right they want right. to support an Amazon right 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 that that's why there's five different food delivery services because all of these VCs are willing to invest billions of dollars in a new food delivery service. <laughs> uh, Dale's got, got a comment she wants to make. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, a friend of mine, Stacy Shiflin, who has an amazing business called Women's Leadership Live. And if you want to pitch your idea, especially about products that are great for HSN, um, they focus all on women and mentorship and they're like the real deal. So when you go to their events, it's like a Shark Tank type of situation and you go home with money, you know? So it's not just like a lot of talk and mm -hmm. these are the real movers and shakers and you can check out their board and who were the very original cool. owners and things like that. Um, so that's a yeah. very well-connected organization. Yeah. Can that, you put um, the, the link in, in the chat sure. for everybody to uh, check out? Uh, let's, we've also got Daniel who has a question. Daniel, I'm gonna bring you on to talk. Hey, Daniel. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm here, here I am. Yeah, what's it's, your question? Yeah, uh, what do you do with like, uh, like partnerships that were not solidified? You know, you guys, you guys were, friends but you you know you worked on a, like a project for years but nothing was solidified in writing or contract or NDA and then that partnership that friendship sours at some point but uh, do you go at do you uh, sue them legally for money that you put into it um, hi Daniel yes absolutely I mean just because you don't have a formal written agreement doesn't necessarily mean you don't have an agreement obviously if you're in business together and you did something together um, then you'd have to if if you're not willing to resolve that party um, that that issue amicably then your next resort would be to take them to court um, the problem obviously is always the proof, right? Proving what the intent of the parties were, what you know, what your agreement was supposed to be, what your share was supposed to be, what you were supposed to do, and then of course the conflict will be on the other side saying you didn't do what you were supposed to do, and therefore you know you don't you shouldn't get what you want to get. Um, and that's what always happens when you don't put things in writing is that now you're relying on people's memory, you're relying on people's interpretations of things that you know may or may not have happened or there was 
clear misunderstanding between the two of you. So it's obviously important to get these things done at the beginning, even if it's, you know, as, as Catherine mentioned earlier, in an MOU or an LOU. But if you don't have any place where your terms and, you know, anything that was discussed, then, you know, you have to rely on the he said, she said type of, um, you know, ordeal that's going to happen when you take this person to court. Um, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to show a lot of evidence to prove um, that you, you are owed, you know, a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Daniel. You're uh, okay. So let, we're running a little bit over. So we, um, we need to, um, uh, go out here, but one final thing Sh Shireen had put in the comments to, um, don't send anybody a deck unless they signed an NDA. So I just wanted to bring that up and then also give you one more resource that I found helpful is um, um, a service like DocSend where you can uh, upload the PDF of your deck and then send the link to somebody. And then if they're gonna look at it, they put in their email address so you, you know who looked at it. And then if they share it, you can actually change the settings. But if you say, you know, anybody who looks at this deck has to first put in their email. That at least gives you a little bit of comfort about where your deck went that with your amazing business idea, because otherwise, if you just send it by email, that thing could be all over the world in a second. So don't do that. <laughs> That's a great tip, Melissa. So, okay, well, definitely reach out to Shireen at Rock and Mobile Law if you um, need some advice uh, on joint partnerships and um, with joint ventures and partnerships. And we appreciate everybody's time today. Um, and feel free to, we always have these up on Facebook uh, and also YouTube. So this is such an important conversation that, you know, please share it with um, the women especially the women that you know that are um, uh, trying to start businesses or grow businesses. And of course, men as well. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, we definitely need to support each other and, and share this valuable advice. So everybody have a great weekend. Thank you for everything, uh, Shireen and Catherine and Dale. Thank you. Thank you. Have bye -bye. a good weekend. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.